I wanted to talk about this morning uh, about a couple of things that are going on in the religious world and um, I was thinking about some of the dangers with some of the kind of new spiritual movements that we're seeing arising and becoming very popular on podcasting etc and uh, I thought I would just kind of like talk a little bit about my nervousness about some of the the things that are popular at the moment won't be naming any names or anything like that uh, just uh, just wanted to kind of throw in a few thoughts about it and um, basically I want to talk about the difference between form and content okay so I mean imagine I'm sitting around going like I used to drink coke but now I drink Pepsi oh well you know I was into Pepsi but now I love uh, seven up going, oh seven up was fine but now I like Mountain Dew Right. What I'm doing there is obviously I'm changing the content of what I'm drinking, but I'm still addicted to sugary drinks. Right. So I'm changing the look of the can. I'm changing the uh, the taste of the drink, but still I have an addiction to that sugar hit. And um, in many ways, that is similar to when we convert from one answer to another. Right, we go from, oh, I thought fame and money would satisfy my longing, uh, but really it's spiritual endeavor. Oh, I thought doing all of this meditation would really help, but actually what I should do is get involved in, in working in the world. Uh, I thought that my work at this homeless shelter would really fill the lack within me, but actually what I should be doing is really trying to make an impact in my interpersonal relationships with my family and friends, that that's really hiding issues that are there. Um, or I thought I would be uh, satisfied by being within this particular confessional religion but really it hasn't worked for me but I found this new religion or this new self-help group that is really helping me and what you find is people are converting at the level of content but they're not converting at the level of form right there is still this addiction to trying to find the thing that will get rid of our anxiety and our suffering that will give us the answer and the issue is this, is new fundamentalisms arise. And the problem with fundamentalisms are they're so easy to spot when they're no longer persuasive, right? So we can always spot the fundamentalisms of the past generations because they're no longer persuasive to us. And so we tend to always think every new generation that we are more freed from religion. We are more freed from fundamentalism. But what generally happens is a society is equally um, as convinced by certain forms of promises for fulfillment and wholeness, satisfaction in the answers. It's just uh, we f the, the new answers are so intuitively right for us that we don't see them as such, right? They are not the water that we see, They're, they are the water that we swim in or they're not the lenses that we can actually look at, they're the lenses which bring everything into focus. And kind of, I suppose to extend the analogy beyond anything uh, sensible, you could say that the fundamentalism of the past is like wearing glasses that eventually start to get scratched, they start to get dirty. Um, and as that happens, you begin to become aware of them. And what we often do then is we exchange those glasses for a new set of glasses that don't have the scratches, that don't have the dirt. And it will take the next generation to start to realize that those fundamentalisms aren't working. So what I've seen um, a little bit at the moment in terms of people who are very, very popular at the moment are new forms of scapegoating new forms of breaking the world into right and wrong, good and bad, new simplifications of the world. And we always love that. I remember when I was a kid, you had the cowboy in an Indian movie and uh, the cowboys were good and the Indians were bad. Uh, and then, you know, they, we kind of turned that around a little bit. You know, movies that like the, in, the Native Americans were, were good and the cowboys were bad. But, you know, the, the original movies are like this, this very easy kind of like, uh, who are the goodies and the baddies? And, controversial as it might be, I don't think it is controversial, but I think uh, splitting uh, and scapegoating are as rife today as they always have been 
It's just the splittings that we do, we justify them in new ways. We don't see them because they are so intuitively correct to us. Um, oh, a good example of this is actually what happened to Naomi Wolf. I think it was just yesterday. <laughs> so Naomi Wolf, who I've never been a huge fan of her work, but she does some interesting things. But uh, she's written a new book um, and it's about sexuality. And I think it's about uh, how homosexuality has been treated legally, uh, historically. And what's interesting about what happened is uh, Wolf made a couple of basic historical errors. She read into the past um, worse things than were really happening. So one example is she used the example of a man who was charged for sodomy and who uh, was sentenced to execution to death. And she used this as an example of how terrible and draconian the past was. Because in the past, this guy, he's literally just having sex with another guy, he gets charged <clears throat> and he gets executed. Now, the interviewer who was interviewing Naomi Wolf uh, pointed out, and it was a very polite conversation, but he said, as in a story, and he said, well, this isn't quite right. When he looked into it, he found that, first of all, sodomy was used to describe a range of activities. And one of those was having sex with minors, what we would call paedophilia. And the actual, this individual uh, was a 17 year old who had sex with a six year old, and that's what he was being charged for. And actually, the phrase um, death recorded, which Naomi Wolf was reading as, whenever she read death recorded, she took that as being execution. So sodomy meant being gay and death recorded meant they were executed. But this, uh, this interviewer pointed out that no death recorded doesn't mean what we think it means. Like it's just a tiny bit of research will show that, and I didn't know this, but I had never heard of the phrase, but death recorded means that a sentence of death was recorded, but not carried out. So this individual, it was a death was recorded but he was showing leniency and mercy. In other words, you don't get it. So lots of these people, death recorded simply meant kind of like that's what you deserve. <laughs> but then the courts come in and they say, but we're not going to do that. We're going to show mercy. We're going to show leniency. We're going to try to reform. Now, the issue is not that in the past and in the present, lots of terrible things happen. But we often uh, see the other who is in the past or in the present as evil and terrible and awful. And when we confront them with that kind of notion that the other is bad, the other is evil, um, then we tend to justify it and rationalize it. And uh, this, this example, I think, was just an example of, of how Naomi Wolf, who, who's a smart writer, uh, made certain mistakes. And potentially those mistakes were made because uh, in her mind, the other was the, the, were the baddies, right? And the other is always easy to write off as evil and terrible and bad. Sometimes they are a bit like that. God, because most people are a bit like that and most uh, political groups have their bad elements. But uh, the point is we can always see how past generations did it wrong, but we are more susceptible to it. And so in this current climate where I'm seeing these new spiritual writers and thinkers coming out, I notice that there is often still this notion of the right answer, the thing that works. And uh, there's a few people I'm thinking of, but who are doing this. And the thing is, they mean it uh, well. They are well intentioned. But the, the problem is partly because if you are suffering from anxiety and brokenness and doubt and unknowing and the trauma that is being human, let alone the traumas that have happened to you, right? Let alone the issues that you're having to deal with also in your life, right? Presently and in the past. You've got all of that. And if you, you know, you're trying to get rid of that, uh, sometimes what happens is you, you try hard enough, you convince yourself that things are going well, you split um, are you, or you engage in what's called the beautiful soul, where you start to project the brokenness and the darkness out into the world, and then, so as to momentarily feel relief from the suffering. And then if you're kind of successful as a person or charismatic, you know, maybe you write a book about it, right? Um, and then you find that that book does quite well, and you start to speak about it. 
and you're a speaker and then um, and then you get a big platform and then you become a guru you're a guru who is who is talking about how to get rid of the anxiety the darkness and the brokenness when a lot of people who get to that level are simply people who have been frantically trying to get rid of their own anxiety and brokenness and doubt and through that frantic fleeing have found themselves having this massive audience now that doesn't include everybody but it's not an uncommon thing that you end up doing the type of job that um, you need for example a lot of counselors a lot of people go into counseling because they actually should have counseling right so the uh, the weird thing is you enter into the profession um, precisely is the is the very profession you kind of need that's why in psychoanalysis you have to do so much analysis because you've got to get work through all that stuff um, often we become the very thing that we're fleeing the reaction formation uh, you see it uh, with people who, for example, are so narcissistic in their presentation in the world. Uh, when you just scratch a little bit beneath the surface and you'll find self-loathing, self-hatred, uh, self-doubt, but it's hidden in its opposite. Or if you meet somebody who's so into apologetics, they read apologetics all the time. Well, of course, that's a reaction formation often which is like that they're doing that precisely because they're full of doubt and unknowing that they're not able to face. And so what on the surface looks like certainty is actually disguised uncertainty. Not disguised from you, but disguised from themselves, disguised from me, right? Uh, a type of form of self-deception. But that's why, I know, as an aside, it's very important for me if you are in that kind of role of helping people and talking about these issues to have had 20 years of reading and reflection and personal work in order to have that stage. Um, and uh, you know, I, I see more and more people who are occupying that stage, maybe because they were really good at something in a different type of field, um, or they're just very charismatic or they're very likable. And so they get to the point where they think they have something to say. Um, but I like in the Jewish tradition, you couldn't even, you know, you weren't even supposed to start preaching or teaching anything until you were 30. Because you're like, well, what have you got to say before you're 30? You've got to spend 10 years just in books and in personal reflection and work in order to actually have something to say. So the ministry begins at 30. And when you think about it, 30 was very old, especially if your life expectancy was 40, right? So um, it was kind of, I think today, the equivalent would probably be, don't say anything till you're 50. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, it, it, it's a lot of work. So here's what I'm concerned about or what I want to, my warning, my, on the pack of cigarettes, you'll get the health warning, right? These are tasty, well, it doesn't say that, but it says these may become addictive, they may have laxative effects or whatever, right? And I'm saying that about these spiritual teachers. Oh, you know, they're fun, but there's a warning to them. These may become addictive and may have laxative effects. And why do these gurus become addictive? Well, it's very simple, right? If you have someone on the stage who's saying, I have the answer because of X. Now, it doesn't matter what X is, just I have the answer and the answer is X. It's this guru, it's this money, it's this fame, whatever then I in the audience, if I have anxiety and doubt and I don't feel that my life is working, then I, I hear this person on stage and I'm like, oh my goodness, he or she has their life together. They have all the answers, they've got it. They're enlightened. And that person is basically saying that they're enlightened. So they're talking about enlightenment and you're like, oh, this person's enlightened. And therefore you go like, I'm not enlightened because I still have the trauma that is life and the traumas that have happened to me in life. I still have these outbursts, I still have weird symptoms, I still have trouble sleeping, I still push away the people that I love, I still not um, uh, able to think clearly about political issues without getting overly emotional, I don't, I can't, I, I can't get involved in the world, I try to hide away and just watch Netflix, whatever it is, right, I've got all of these issues um, and I, can't, I find it hard to go out or I find it hard to be alone, whatever it is. And you go, okay, but this person, I want what they've got. I want that. So you become more, so what they do is they, they inflame those feelings. They fan those feelings in you and they hold out the answer. 
but you never get the answer. So now you're, you're, you keep going back, you keep going back, right? Now, if they were successful, as in if somehow uh, you did everything they told you to do, right? You bought all their books, you did all their courses, you, you stood on one leg, you, you know, rubbed your tummy and tapped your head, you did everything that they said, then you would begin to realize it didn't work. Right, so you get to the end. This is why in Scientology, it's amazing. You know, it's very hard to get to OT yet because you've got to do so much. Because of course, at the very end, you realize it doesn't work. Right, so what you've got to do is you've got to keep increasing the distance. You're almost there. You're almost there. And even now, you know, Scientology reinvents their levels. So new OT it. Right, it's because. In a way, there is no end because there is no answer. But as long as the answer is always just out of reach, just out of reach, you are addicted to it. You keep moving towards it and failing to get it. This is called in psychoanalysis a lost object. The lost object is an object that doesn't exist. It's originarily lost. So in theology, it's called original sin. So an object that is original, you're separated from, but it's it doesn't exist. It's an original separation, an original sense of loss that that enslaves us to it, that we keep trying to pursue and trying to get. And the answer is not a conversion that gets us from one answer to another. True radical conversion is what converts us out of the need to have conversion, right? It's what converts us from the need to have, to have salvation, salvation from salvation. The ability to see and make peace with and reckon with and tarry with your own doubts, anxieties, and traumas, and turning them into something good and beautiful. Um, or if not beautiful, turning them into a fuel that, that, that fuels further movement in your life. It is, I mean, grace is the technical term for this, because grace is not that you have to move from A to B. Grace is you don't have to move anywhere, just be. And when you experience grace in your life, you're able to sit still, you're able to just simply let everything speak. You're not trying to deny it, run away from it, move forward from it. You simply be. But weirdly, that experience of grace actually is, is how to undergo fundamental transformation, right? So that's, that's the whole Pauline thing, is that you know people say, well, if you don't have the law that tells you you should do this, you should do that, you shouldn't do X, you shouldn't do Y, you shouldn't do Z. If you didn't have that, you'd just do anything you want. But the idea is actually, the more you have these laws and these rules of what you have to do in order to get enlightenment, um, the more enlightenment dissipates, it's, it's, it's far away, it's the more anxiety producing you experience it to be. And so the very, rule, the very law that is trying to help you find enlightenment is the very thing that simultaneously stops you from getting it. The way to fulfill the law is to experience grace, where you don't have to do anything. But ironically, just like in AA, whenever you experience the grace of just admitting the truth in a room full of people, not having to do anything, step zero, just being in a room of people who just accept you for who you are, that is the event that enables the other steps to become effective, to have efficiency, right? Is fundamentally the idea of I don't have to do anything. Now, for people who are on a stage, this is very important because when you're on a stage, you are symbolically, the in the, in the spiritual world, you are symbolically the absolute in a particular form, right? People don't think that, right? People aren't consciously thinking it. But what you do is you tend to project onto these others um, symbolic values. And in a spiritual context, you're projecting onto your favorite gurus. You're putting onto them uh, unconsciously the absolute itself. So when they speak, it's not just them. It's them as a, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, symbolic figure. And when you as a symbolic figure of the absolute talk about wholeness, completeness, enlightenment because of X, because of Y, because of Z, then that gives the feeling that in order to be at one with the absolute, I need to get rid of the lack that is within me. But if you on stage are able to say, I'm lost, you know, I have traumas. Trauma is part of 
the very being of human beings. It's a part of actually the very structure of reality itself. And, and you know, the, I can talk about that, but, but I have experienced that in my life and continue to. That is like the absolute is saying that, right? And therefore it can free you from this. So instead of saying, I will be one with the absolute whenever I feel one with myself, a lack of lack, you go, oh my goodness, I connect with the with everything insofar as the absolute itself is riven. It has lack within it. Now, this is what I meant on the fundamentalist. I think it was last week we were talking about this. And I was saying that uh, most people will move, will convert from confessional Christianity to kind of a new age type of mysticism. It's a very common thing because um, they haven't undergone what can be called redoubled kenosis. So what is redoubled kenosis? So kenosis is self-emptying, right? So the experience of self-emptying, um, the kenotic experience of the universe, like the universe itself is an infinite density that is emptying itself. And in that emptying, creates everything, right? So that's a kenotic hymn of the universe. Uh, kenosis happens with, uh, you know, the death of uh, uh, God and science, where God is no longer used as a hypothesis in order to do, say, physics or chemistry or whatever, right? This is, but this is a death, this is a kenotic self-emptying, like a crucifixion, a death of God on the cross, that degenerates something productive. So there's a number of these kenotic events. And I would argue that Christianity is best understood as helping individuals experience that kenosis. But there's two elements of it. The first is that we experience the own, uh, our own uh, doubt and anxiety and traumas, that we come to look at that, we empty ourselves, we experience the emptiness that we are, these lacks that are within us. We don't run from them, we experience them. That's easy, so that's the first kenosis. The second kenosis is when we realize that the absolute is also, uh, that the, it's called ontological lack, that the absolute also is lacking. And this is of course the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This moment where you see God experiencing the loss of God. Now, symbolically what that means is if I start to see the weakness of my own religious position, Right? So I start to see that my religion is, is just historically grounded, it's just contingent, it's just the nature of where I grew up in life, what books were read to me, etc, etc. Then I can go, right, I want to leave that behind, but then I can go off and find a new temple. That temple didn't work, but I've got a new temple. But redoubled kenosis is when you experience that, when the temple is, is the place that you go to experience the idea that uh, the temple is in all of us, the priesthood of all believers. It's like, it's not that there's no temple or we move from one to the other, is that we experience a crumbling of our belief, our confessional religion, say, but then we realize that that crumbling is part of the religious truth itself. That's the, that's the difference. So one is, there's my religious belief and it's crumbling. But if you experience that, then you're maybe prone to go into something else. But if you then go, oh, it's not that my religion is crumbling, but that the crumbling is part of the truth of the religion itself. It is the, the heart of what it's trying to draw me into. Then you, you move from what Paul Tillich called an unbroken myth to a broken myth. So an unbroken myth is a story you tell yourself about why you're here, where you're going, what it's all about. But it's unbroken because you believe it's true. And Tillich says you can move from one unbroken myth to another unbroken myth, but not much changes. But the real challenge is how do you move from an unbroken myth to a broken myth? In other words, how do you experience the own antagonisms and contradictions that are within your given worldview, your ideology? Come to see those through a, de a very careful engagement with your tradition, whatever your tradition is, experiencing those, becoming aware of the contradictions and therefore robbing them of their sting. This is exactly what Freud meant by symptom, by the way. A symptom is a congealment of contradiction. So for example, you always are chewing at night. You know, you, your, your jaw is aching, your teeth are, are being worn down. Maybe 
you discover that um, you're really angry with somebody, your boss, but also you can't show that anger, right? You'll get fired, whatever. So the contradiction is manifesting in a symptom. The symptom is the congealment of a contradiction within your psychic life. And the notion is as you become aware of the contradiction, you can take away the, uh, the negativity of the symptom and also find a way to more productively do something with that contradiction. So you come to know it and then you come to, to work it through. And uh, I guess the movement to a broken myth is not dissimilar because it's, it's where you realize that whatever tradition you're in and you might move from one to another, the real challenge is to see that none of these ideological systems are able to clean up the cracks within life, paper over the contradictions. They are actually the result of the contradictions, deny, right? They are, they are not the answer to the problem. They are um, the, the problem manifested in terms of a symptom. And when we begin to realize that existentially, um, we can begin to, to be freed from it. So in a nutshell, the danger is, and by the way, I'm talking about secular and sacred forms of religion here. I mean, pop music is the new hymn, right? Because if you think of religious music as music that posits an answer, right? So religious music is all about you know, praising God who is going to make everything great and who's there for us and who gives us ultimate happiness. You know, we're singing all these songs. Then, of course, that's what pop music is. Pop music is... Uh, doing all of that just with a different X. It might be revenge, it might be money, it might be fame. But pop music is a type of religious worship of some object that frees us from the difficulties of life. Just like Hollywood movies tend towards that. Whereas independent movies and independent music is designed not to cover over the antagonisms and the gaps that are within us, but to reveal them in a way that is beautiful, in a way that is um, kind of liberating. So that's, a, I think, a good way to roughly talk about the difference between independent movies and Hollywood movies, with some very good exceptions, is that generally indie movies tend towards exposing uh, the, the gaps, the antagonisms and the, the traumas of life uh, and Hollywood tends to cover over them, to give us a, a look at the, the contemporary ideology that is attempting to help us avoid that. And the best Hollywood movies actually, like things like Fight Club or whatever, they, um, they actually do what a type of indie would do but in a very Hollywood style and the best indie movies do what they do, but with a little bit more slickness and they're less boring, right? <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, I worry that there's a lot of pop um, spiritual gurus out there uh, who we are, we're all susceptible to it. So the reason why I'm doing this little reflection here is I'm just kind of going like, whoever it is, and it, me or whoever it is, if you ask yourself, are they selling me the new way to wholeness, completeness, and satisfaction. In some way, are they, are they kind of enacting a type of guru who is kind of trying to say, I have the answer, and if you just follow this, everything's gonna be wonderful. And then just be cautious of that. Because here, honestly, the truth is, right, as I say, I know people who, they start off just trying to work out their own stuff, but then they start to talk about it, and then they start to write about it. And you know what, if you're not careful, the next thing you're doing is you're handing out names. You're renaming people, right? You're actually enacting this ridiculous notion of the guru, right? Um, I'm all for the guru, uh, but the idea of the last guru, right? I'm all for gurus in the sense of, I think that we all project out to others, um, kind of teachers, uh, various of various kinds someone who has the answer and that works we all need to look to other people to help us at times and so we naturally can project out to some guru that they have the answer the issue is this is that a true spiritual leader should attempt to be the last guru right they're the guru who reveals the secret that there is no guru they are the guru who helps reveal to you your own freedom your own responsibility your own uh, embeddedness in life with all of its difficulties. So the true guru doesn't reject it. They allow you to, to think that they are for a time, 
and they help you realize that there's none so that you don't move from one guru who fails because they all fail eventually to another the, the very good guru is the one who they feel but they are so bad that they destroy the very structure of gurus that, uh, uh, themselves and this is called self-castration it's worth and kids go through it or should go through it is when you think that your mother or your father is perfect and wonderful and brilliant but then eventually you realize that they're just a normal person like you and that takes time but that experience is traumatic but it is also part of growing up and if that doesn't happen then uh, all sorts of problems arise and that fa family members parents need to enact their own death or at least it's going to happen anyway and often in adolescence it happens in a very extreme way but you've got to allow it to happen at least let it happen realize that part of your role as a parent is to die of course you're going to die physically but you have to die symbolically first and if you don't die symbolically first you will die physically and you will remain alive symbolically and your your kids will continue to try to be pleasing you in their relationships and in their jobs and all of this kind of stuff because you will re remain alive to them in a symbolic way which is not healthy you need to die symbolically so that when you die biologically your children will mourn you and will remember you but they will not um, be ensnared and colonized by their supposed desire to please you they will be able to take responsibility for their lives and make their own mistakes and of course as a parent yeah, that's ultimately i guess what you want you want your kid to at first they look to you for all the answers and for freedom and then very gradually they realize and you help them realize that they have to take responsibility for their own freedom and then they move on so that's my concern with um some of the stuff that I'm seeing is there's new fundamentalisms. We're not freed from them. Every generation thinks they are. Oh, we're free. We're free. We're, we're getting less religious. We're getting less caught up. But no, it's just the old ones are not persuading us anymore. But there's lots of new ones. Lots of new ones being sold. Um, and that often they're being sold by people who are not evil or bad. or uh, In fact, they're often very kind and very good natured, uh, very smart. Uh, but there are often people who have just been trying to flee from their own lack um, and have found themselves now preaching how to do that to others. And the difficult thing is, whenever you're trying to flee it, you always have to do further, go further, go further to, to avoid it until you're maybe on a stage in front of tens of thousands of people. Um, and uh, the, that's, that's the danger. That's actually what, that's why it takes a lot of work and there's a lot of responsibility to try to take that role. It's not something to do lightly. And what I think should be enacted is uh, a type of symbolic death. Um, that's, that's the enactment. And I've often talked about Kumari as a documentary that kind of like subtly looks at that structure. So if you haven't seen it, uh, check it out. It's a guy who pretends to be a guru. People start following him and then um, uh, he eventually has to reveal that he's not a guru and it's that revelation. <laughs> By the way, there's two types of revelation in the, doc in the documentary and then I'll stop. I'll see if there's any questions. Um, the first is he reveals that he doesn't have the answer, but he reveals he doesn't have the answer in such a way that everybody thinks that that is the answer. Right? So he says it with his fake voice and his guru things as we, I do not have the answer. And everybody's like, oh, we do not have the answer. But you see that they're weirdly even holding on to that as if it's the answer. But then the big thing is when he walks in and he's dressed normally and he doesn't put on a silly accent, he doesn't pretend to, to be some kind of somebody from India who comes with this truth. He doesn't have a massive staff that he carries. He just comes in in jeans and a t-shirt and says, to be honest with you guys, I was, um, I, I, I was lying. At first, this was a funny thing to do to expose how silly gurus are, but then it just became big. And he says, and I started to care about you and I started to feel bad and I'm sorry, I, I'm not a guru. And it was that moment that he is. It's at that moment that he becomes the last guru. The last guru in the sense that they experienced that all of the community and the stuff that we went through was to do with them. And it's quite a powerful kind of end. So 
I mean, I definitely can be read as saying the secret is there is no secret, as if that's the secret. But if that is what is preventing you from doing the work of looking at the difficulties of life, of, of, of our political world and our personal world, then that is itself a barrier that needs to be broken through. Right? It's not an intellectual thing that you get to the right answer, even if the answer is there is no answer. Right? It's we need to create spaces, liturgical spaces and liturgical technologies that are designed to actually help us existentially enter into that space. And by liturgical technologies, I mean you might get it at the pub on a Friday night, you might get it at a poker room on the Saturday night, you might get it at a confessional on the Sunday morning, you might get it at the coffee shop on that Monday afternoon that you meet with your friends. But where are the spaces in your life that are helping you to enter into that space and not flee from it? And be careful of anyone, obviously including myself, that would tell you that there's some shortcuts to this. Because... Uh, there isn't. Okay, uh, I'll just look to see if there's any questions and then uh, uh, if anybody's been watching this. Ha ha. <laughs> the secret is Peter's library. Uh, you know what? My library, Paula, is that pa Apollo? Paulo? Um, I have, this is a good thing for me because I used to have a really big library and uh, then it's just got smaller and smaller because I've moved around so much and at first it was very sad and now I actually I love it. I'm thinking of getting rid of the rest of my books because um, I read most things online. So yeah, um, let's see. And I'll pause. I'm unable to betray power of theology. It's addicting. Beware. Absolutely. The one exception to all of this is of course what I'm saying. I am the true guru and my work will give you the answer. Uh, you know, just uh, send me a check and it'll all be fine. <laughs> um, let's see, 14 costs. Oh, great. There's a, I'm really, it's really nice that some people are watching this live. It's actually got harder and harder to do these because uh, I think Facebook is making it uh, a little bit more difficult for you to get to people who follow your page. So in the past, you know, everybody got notification that I was doing a video, but now I don't think very many people do. Um, yeah, oh yeah, Chris says, allowing others to stand on their own is the greatest peace one can have, yeah. It's, and it's a beautiful work um, to, for us to do, is when we learn to be at peace with ourselves and we uh, are able to maybe be a space where people can help to do that for themselves, it's wonderful. Um, it's like a, so that it's like whenever, you know, you, you hear someone who's ill or who's going through a breakup, and, and you might, you might want to say, it's all going to be okay. You're like, Why do you want to say that? Sometimes it's because you want to say it to the other person, that's fine. But sometimes you want to say it to yourselves. Like the other person's suffering is, is a reminder of our own suffering that we want to avoid. So by telling them it's all going to be okay, we're unconsciously telling ourselves that it's going to be okay. But the more comfortable you are with your own sufferings and traumas, which, which simply means the more you have faced the antagonisms in your life and find a way to help them fuel you, the less likely you need to cover over other people's suffering. And therefore you can say something like this, you can say, that, that must be devastating. Uh, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, can, like, can you just tell me a little bit more about what's going on? And you can bear the other person's pain because you find a way to bear your own. And um, you know, it's still very, very difficult, but I think sometimes that can create a more positive environment for change and at all sorts of levels.